Thank you for connecting with the Pennsylvania Game Commission today. My name is Brittany Howell and my colleague Lori and I will be managing this session. We're fortunate to be joined today by Lisa Williams, the rough grouse biologist for the Pennsylvania Game Commission. She'll be talking to us about the state's grouse population status and management. We expect this presentation to last about 30 minutes, followed by a question and answer period of about 10 minutes. You can type your questions by typing into the type question here box on the GoToWebinar control panel at the right of your screen. For those of you dialing in to listen by phone, please note that this is not a toll-free call and you may receive long distance charges from your service provider. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to our presenter. Lisa, could you share a little bit about your background before you get started? Sure. Uh, first, I thank you all for joining us to learn about grouse. Um, and for those of you who don't know me, I've been in the Game Commission uh, for decades, since 1988 actually, and uh, I spent about 20 years in the bat management program in the non-game section um, and, and lived through the effects of white nose fungus, so uh, white nose syndrome. And I think that sort of set me up in some ways to notice when we had, you know, a new disease on the scene. So um, my background, I think, sort of led me to some of the places here with grouse management. So this is my first webinar, <clears throat> and I feel kind of like a crazy person just sitting here talking to the computer. Uh, so bear with me as we go. I was also up last night with a sick spaniel. So with all the excuses out of the way, We'll go ahead and get started. Um, I want to talk about the population status, as Brittany said, uh, our ongoing disease study, what we're doing with habitat, and also what we're doing with harvest um, in terms of hunting regulations and where we'd like to go from here. I want to be sure to talk about what we know and what we don't know. Okay, <laughs> my first technical glitch. Um, <clears throat> so when I talk about population status, the first thing I really think of, and you probably think of, is abundance. We get this data from hunter diaries. We get about 7,000 hours of recorded hunts per year from roughly 300 grouse cooperators who are looking in good habitat, actively looking for grouse. So it's a very strong data set. And this graph shows you the past 50 years of abundance data that we have going back to 1965. You can see this sort of tipping point that occurred in the early 2000s where we had dramatic declines followed by a pretty weak recovery and then continued dramatic declines. So we have this, uh, these record lows kind of accumulating at this point. The most worrisome thing about this is that we know this data is coming from good habitat. So populations aren't recovering even when their circumstances are, are good. Looking beyond hunter flush rates um, at grouse production, we have run a brood survey since 1981. And that's another way that I look at how the population is doing. So this graph shows you our June observations of broods in blue. July is in red. And the, you see that annual variation that you would expect with brood production. But the important thing to notice here is that June and July are tracking very well together. So if it's a good year in June, it's a good year in July. Um, and you would expect that. If production is good, we're not looking at the same broods in June and July, but if production is good, um, we should expect to see similar numbers um, if we have good production, good survival. And we did have that for the first 20 years of the survey. But beginning in the early 2000s, you see this difference. June and July are no longer tracking well together. You can see here that even though June production in blue is on an increasing trend, we're not seeing comparable numbers in July. Juvenile production we see in June is no longer being reflected by survival in July. In fact, these show record low years that again are accumulating here recently, just like we saw with flush, flush rates. This suggests that juvenile mortality may be one mechanism by which West Nile virus impacts statewide populations. 
I talk about West Nile virus because it coincides completely with that early 2000 tipping point that we see in grouse population. West Nile virus, for those of you who don't know, it's we typically think of it as a bird disease. It's carried by mosquitoes who bite birds and the cycle then continues. Occasionally a human or a horse will also get sick, but primarily at this point we view it as a bird disease. It was first discovered in New York City in 1999 and started spreading along the coast. In the year 2000, started spreading up into southern New England and had entered Pennsylvania. By 2001, it jumped from New England into other parts of the country. And by 2002, it nearly covered the country and it was in every county in Pennsylvania. So it was a new uh, emerging situation for our wild birds to deal with. When I was thinking about West Nile virus and you see the spread that it did quickly across the country, I knew that if West Nile virus was causing problems for Pennsylvania grouse, we should see it in other places also. And when I look at hunter flush rates for the mid-Atlantic states, again, you see that situation in the early 2000s where populations declined pretty dramatically. So the fingerprints went beyond Pennsylvania. But just because two things seem to be related, it doesn't mean that they are related. We couldn't say that this was all caused by West Nile virus. You could look at this and say, well, we had some terrible weather for brood production. Or you could say, boy, the predators were really taking a hit on grouse those first those years. So just because they seem to be related doesn't mean they are. But it was certainly a smoking gun for me to continue investigating the disease as part of the grouse problem. So in 2015, we developed a challenge study where we would actually see if grouse were susceptible to the virus. Um, a lot of related birds are not. They will be exposed to the virus. They essentially shrug it off. They may develop antibodies, but they really have no dramatic problems with it. So we didn't know what to expect for grouse. We started looking for wild grouse eggs across the Commonwealth. We needed chicks for this study that had never been bitten by a mosquito. So the best way to get that was to get them in the egg. We then transported those eggs to a propagator in Idaho who had a quarantine facility so he could guarantee that those chicks would not contact mosquitoes. He raised them to about four to five weeks of age and then we shipped them again to Colorado State University to one of the premier West Nile labs in the country um, with Dr. Bowen. Gave them a couple of days to settle in and then actually inoculated them with the virus to see what would happen. And this is what we found. 40% of the chicks died within the first week. Remaining 40 to 50% of chicks lived through that second week. But when we opened those chicks up, they had organ damage to pretty much all of their major systems. This is the kind of organ damage that I'm talking about. On the left here, you see normal heart tissue. You see those nice muscle fibers neatly aligned. On the right, you see infected tissue. So in the upper right here, all of that purple is inflammation. And you see those muscle fibers are, are essentially wrecked. In the lower right, this rusty color that you see is actual virus stained um, in the tissue of the heart itself. We saw similar damage in the brain of these birds. The study that was just published on this, um, and I'll give you the title here <clears throat> soon, it was in the Journal of Veterinary Pathology, their findings said, you know, based on clinical and pathological responses, mortality of rough grouse may be as high as 90%. So the information coming out of this challenge study was very, very grim for birds infected in a lab. What we didn't know was if that really was relevant to our wild grouse. We couldn't just assume that what happened in the lab is what's happening out in Penn's woods. So we went back to our hunter cooperators. We sent them these filter paper strips 
and asked them when they harvested a grouse to quickly soak that strip in blood and send us a feather set. That way we could check and see we're looking specifically for antibodies to West Nile virus, evidence that it was in the wild population. And this is what we found. We sampled over a two year period. We got more than 400 blood samples and the average over that two years was that 19% of the harvest, essentially 20% of the harvest, had antibodies to West Nile virus. This means that those birds were exposed to the disease, but they had survived. The lab folks tell me that it also means that they're likely immune and likely immune for life. So this was sort of a good news, bad news situation for us. We didn't see that we had virus in every region of the state. We saw differences between the regions, but we also saw that we had survivors in every region. So that really gives us something to work with in terms of management. The regions behave very differently with grouse and West Nile virus. And this is sort of complicated, but I'll show you what we're looking at. This top graph is our Northwest region, our North Central region, and to some extent our Northeast is very similar to this. On the bottom is our south central region and all of the southern regions are, are very similar to this graph down here. The black line shows abundance. Those are the hunter flush rates over time and the red bars show years of very high West Nile virus activity. So if you look here in the early 2000s when the virus first hit the state you see these dramatic declines that occurred both north and south in Pennsylvania. Then the birds got a break for a few years. And in the north, they did this beautiful recovery. Those populations shot back up higher than we've seen in decades and well above long-term average. And that's the really frustrating thing. If it weren't for this virus, it seems that these should be boom days for grouse up in the northern part of the state. But then you have another bad virus year come in or a series of bad years and you see this population decline again. The difference in the South, you do see that it, that initial crash, you do see a recovery, but it's a rather weak recovery. And then you see continued declines as the virus comes through. So what these birds really need more than anything is a break from the virus. Unfortunately, they did not get that this year. This summer 2017 was one of the worst West Nile virus years that we've seen since we started keeping track. So. Uh, grim news again this year. But from this information, this is the graph that really um, generated this statement that I keep saying when I'm talking, doing public speaking, that grouse do better in good habitat. So they do better, they seem to do better individually because we find a higher proportion of survivors in areas of good habitat. And they certainly do better in terms of population recovery in areas of good habitat. We really wanted to investigate this idea of virus and habitat and how they might be working together on grouse populations. And this is sort of the push-pull of what we found. This was just published in the Journal of Wildlife Management this year. We're looking at grouse persistence. How well do local populations um, persist in an area over a 20-year period using breeding bird atlas data? We're also looking at grouse colonization. How well do local populations move into new areas over this 20 year snapshot? And then how does that relate to the frequency of West Nile virus in an area, the loading of the virus, and then how does it relate to young forests? So that's essentially what we're looking at. The two graphs on the left here show you that as West Nile virus increases on the landscape, the chances the odds that a local population will persist or move into new cover declines as we see more virus on the landscape. Over here you see young forest. If young forest in an area is on a positive trend, you're actually accumulating young forest over this 20 year period, the chances of your local grouse persisting are greatly increased and the chances of your local grouse colonizing new areas is increased. So it's not a question of is it disease or is it 
young forest as habitat. It's clearly both, and they're exerting opposite pressures on these local populations. So again, I say, grouse do better in good habitat. But what do I really mean when I say that? It's not just a matter of how many saplings you have in a stand. There's actually a variety of factors that we need to consider if we really want to maximize benefits to grouse. Certainly, abundance of habitat is key. The National Grouse Plan and the Pennsylvania Grouse Plan call for about 15% of our landscape to be in young forest. Currently, we're at 7%, and I think that's about standard for the mid-Atlantic states. By my calculations, that means we're 800,000 acres short in Pennsylvania, not just on game lands, but across the state and across different types of ownerships, we are short on young forest. We also need to think about high quality habitat. So when we are making grouse habitat, we want different forest age classes close together because grouse are using those forest ages differently throughout the year. Within that site, we also want abundant food that's producing year round. So a diversity of species that's offering food to grouse in every season. So they don't have to wander far to look for the food they need. We need these habitats to be well connected. Different grouse management areas need to be relatively close together because we want populations to be able to find each other. And we want young birds to be able to find safe cover when they disperse from their brood area. And then finally, in Pennsylvania, we have this issue of forest type. The northern hardwoods are up in the northern third of Pennsylvania. And generally, everything is better for grouse in the northern hardwoods. The oak hickory forest type takes up the southern two thirds of Pennsylvania in general. And grouse have a harder time in oak hickory forests. And that was shown to us by that large Appalachian study that many of you are familiar with. So habitat's a complex issue, but I tend to talk in shorthand and say grouse do better in good habitat. But it's not as simple as cut a tree, save a grouse. Um, just to give you an example, before 2015, before we knew really about West Nile virus, when I was talking to foresters about brood habitat, I would say, look for low-lying, moist bottomlands with abundant ground cover. That abundant ground cover is going to attract a lot of insects for very young chicks, and the ground cover itself will serve as forage when those chicks transition to a plant diet. So that was the ideal brood site description just a couple years ago. But now I'm not so sure. I'm not sure that's the best place for us to be thinking about brood cover anymore. Those low, moist bottomlands could be a real risk to grouse now that we know about West Nile virus. So in this, this past summer, in 2017, we spent a lot of time trapping mosquitoes in grouse habitat to try to figure out what that dynamic is for mosquitoes and disease and grouse. We did this in collaboration with our Department of Environmental Protection. They have a West Nile virus surveillance program, and they were incredible in getting us set up for this study. We trapped 15,000 mosquitoes from June to the middle of September. 25 different species were found in grouse habitat. I didn't even know there were 25 species of mosquitoes in Pennsylvania, and apparently there are 50 or 60 species. But we found 25 of them in grouse habitat. Eight of them were the, in our sort of zone of interest. They occurred in the habitat, they could carry the disease, and they bit birds. Some of our mosquitoes don't even bite birds. Some of them specialize on amphibians. It's kind of an amazing world of mosquito biology when you get into it. But we did find, you know, the few, the eight that we thought could be relevant to grouse. We also did a lot of work in water sources to figure out what kinds of water sources are producing these different species. And we narrowed down our list to the, what we feel is the prime suspect for West Nile in grouse habitat, Culex restuans. It's a known carrier of West Nile virus. It occurred in every site that we trapped. And of those 15,000 mosquitoes, it made up a quarter of every, every sample. So very abundant, very happy in grouse habitat, and a known vector. 
When these sites started going positive for West Nile in July and August, it was always this species that tested positive. So we're pretty confident that at least in Pennsylvania, this is one of the prime species we should be paying attention to. Working with DEP, they gave us 800,000 data points for where Culex restaurants occurred in Pennsylvania. I immediately shifted those over to somebody else to look at. <laughs> the Fish and Wildlife Cooperative Research Unit at Penn State did a really quick look and started looking at the landscape variables that seem to be associated with this species. The reason we started looking at this is that we have to work smarter, not just harder, in terms of habitat. We need to identify these barriers and thresholds that may suppress the mosquito so that we can figure out where they are, where they aren't, and then we know where to put grouse habitat. We're already seeing some exciting information just with this very first blush at the data. Uh, we're seeing some really interesting stuff about elevation thresholds, and we'll be learning more in coming years as we really unwrap this mosquito data. This is very preliminary information, but I've already started talking about it with our foresters. When I talk about thresholds to Culex restuons, it seems to occur at about the 1,200 foot level of elevation. In Pennsylvania, that's pretty good news because that means all of this pale green and all of the brown are above that threshold. So we have lots of areas that we can think about really focusing on grouse management. Again, it's preliminary, but when I talk to foresters now, we're now talking about elevation. And then we get busy. The Game Commission has an active forest management program. In the past year, we harvested 8,500 acres. That's a 50% increase over the past 10 year average. The acreage offered for bid has increased every year since 2011. These foresters are ready to go. They're ready to get busy for grouse. Just yesterday, the agency announced 13 new forest tech positions opening up. So we are gung-ho and ready to go. Habitat is one thing that we can control directly. The other thing that we can control directly is harvest and hunting. The goal of sustainable hunting is to harvest surplus animals that would otherwise die, typically in the winter. That's typically the highest season of mortality. So we want to be harvesting surplus animals in a population. We don't want to be biting into the bank account too much. This shows you the year in the life of a game animal. You have spring breeding, which then creates the summer surplus. You have a lot of additional animals in your population. You set your harvest so that you're harvesting from that surplus before that high period of mortality occurs because you know a lot of birds are gonna die anyway in the winter. So you can put your harvest here and actually get that surplus into your harvested population. So does grouse hunting impact Pennsylvania populations? We don't know. And I'm very honest about that when I talk to hunters. And they say, how can you not know? Well, we don't know the harvest rate for grouse in Pennsylvania. We don't know what proportion of grouse we're actually taking each year relative to the entire population. What we do know is that the population math has changed since the early 2000s. Baseline natural mortality has increased. And that changes the math on hunting for us. We also know, unfortunately, that West Nile virus mortality occurs before the hunting season. So it's reducing that population surplus, that summer surplus. But we don't know by how much. Lots of unknowns with hunting and impact on grouse. But here's what we do know. Going back to this map of where we found survivors, 20% of our harvested birds have antibodies to West Nile and are likely immune for life. During the two years that we were collecting blood samples, 51,000 grouse were harvested in Pennsylvania. If we take that 20% figure and apply to the grouse harvest, it means that we probably harvested around 10,000 survivors of West Nile virus. If we roll that back out and think about survival, 
in terms of how many grouse survive West Nile, what proportion that 10,000 might be. I use 30 to 50 percent. That's pretty generous compared to what they found in the lab. But at a 30 to 50 percent survival rate, it means 10,000 to 30,000 birds may have died before the hunting season opened. And so that's what I mean when I say that summer surplus is being reduced before we are in the field with our bird dogs. So the grouse population is changing and we're going to change with it. I've developed a responsive harvest framework for setting future seasons. This provides a mechanism for the season to change as grouse numbers change. It would result in a conservative season when populations are low. When populations are high, it would allow us to liberalize the season and provide more hunting opportunity. The framework would rely on grouse abundance data that we get from our, our hunter diaries grouse production data that we get from our summer sighting survey with acknowledgement of disease risk. Fortunately, we have strong data sets to allow this approach to work. We have decades of good hunter flush rate data, summer sighting data, and we have nearly 20 years now of DEPs, disease surveillance. These strong grouse data sets and this growing collaboration with DEP, the Human Health Surveillance Program, are assets that few other states have available. So if any state is going to try to turn this around for rough grouse, it makes sense for Pennsylvania to try. This approach provides a consistent and transparent way to establish the grouse season so that hunters know why and how decisions are being made. Now we talked before about how population trends are very different in the north versus the south of Pennsylvania. We know these two regions behave differently in terms of population. We know they face differential survival pressure, and we know they face differential disease pressure. So the harvest framework that I've developed uses a split zone to set future grouse seasons. The northern portion and the southern portions will be managed independently from one another. It's based on the issues I already discussed and with consideration of hunter opinion. In 2015, we did a hunter, grouse and woodcock hunter survey, and we asked about a split zone, and we found that 58% of respondents supported that approach. So basically, this is how the harvest framework works, and this is how I derived the 2018 season recommendation that I presented to our commissioners a couple weeks ago. Season length is a product of abundance, production, and disease. When all these things look good, we would have a four-week late season. For us, that starts the day after Christmas and runs through January. When all these indicators are moderate, we would have a one-week post-Christmas season, and that would be the most popular week, the week between Christmas and New Year's. If the numbers all look grim, then we have a closed late season. So it's consistent, it's transparent, and it's responsive to what the grouse are doing. It allows our hunters to know how decisions are being made and why they're being made. It's similar to frameworks that we use for migratory game birds and for other species in Pennsylvania, but it's never been used for grouse in Pennsylvania. We're in sort of new territory now. Now, when I talk about numbers being high or moderate or low, this is what I'm talking about. I just split the data into quartiles so that the top 25% of everything we've seen is considered high, the bottom 25% is considered low, and the middle 50 falls into that moderate category. I'll show you here how it works. Just follow me across the screen from left to right. In years of high abundance, high hunter flush rates, we next check summer production. If it's high, we go with a four-week season. If summer production is just moderate, then we check West Nile virus. If West Nile virus has been quiet for the summer before, we go with a four-week season. If it's been moderate or highly active, then we are drop down and we are more conservative with a one-week season. Looking in years of moderate abundance, so moderate hunter flush rates, 
If production is high, looking good, we check West Nile virus. If West Nile virus has been quiet the summer before, we go with a four week season. If it's been moderate to highly active, we drop down into a more conservative season. So it's pretty straightforward, it's pretty consistent and transparent to anyone who wants to sort of predict the season. The cutoffs between low, moderate and high, I've calculated using the data since West Nile virus got here. There's no reason for us to sort of penalize current grouse populations by expecting them to perform like populations did in the 1970s. So these cutoffs, these thresholds have been modified already based on sort of the new normal for grouse. With these cutoffs, I really just take the current values that we're seeing in the data and I see where they fall within the cutoff. You can see the numbers for 2017 are all pretty grim. This information is on our website, so you can certainly take a look at this table, and uh, I don't expect you to take it all in now, but all of this information is essentially available on our website, and I'll give you the link later. Okay, so what does that mean for 2018? I took the 2017 data for the northern management zone, remember the split zone now, fall abundance was low, summer production was low. So this population has not had a chance to recover since the terrible population levels that we saw back in 2016. So the framework recommends a closed late season. In the southern management zone, fall abundance was moderate. Production, however, was low. So again, very limited opportunity for a population to recover. The framework gives us a recommendation for a closed late season. Now, the reason I seem to be picking on the late season is that we know in these latter parts of the grouse season, more than 50% of our harvest are adult birds. And we would rather have those birds moving into the breeding season, given the situation that we're in right now. The goal of all of this, the framework, the split zone, is to increase breeding populations, to bring up baseline numbers move birds into the breeding season, particularly moving more adult birds into the breeding season. It'll begin here in March, April, May. I want to assure hunters that we will be assessing success over time. Just to be clear, we don't know if this will work. So we will be assessing it over time to see if it seems to be making a difference. I'll run two models in the background as we get new data each year. One will assume that we're making a detectable difference. And that's a pretty heavy lift to actually see with habitat, with disease, to actually see if harvest change is making a detectable difference. But one model will assume that. The other model will assume that we're not making a detectable difference. And over time, as we see which model behaves better, we should get an idea if we're on the right track. So grouse in Pennsylvania are in a pretty dangerous place right now. They're pretty vulnerable. Things feel a little precarious. There's really no way to sugarcoat that. I invite you to look uh, at our website for more information. I want to thank you for joining us to understand more about what we're doing here with grouse management in Pennsylvania. And I thank you for your passion to try to help us get, get it right when we're working for these birds. To see more about our grouse management, probably more than you ever want to, you can go to this link on our website. But the way that I remember how to get there is to go to our main web page, click hunt trap, hunting, and you'll get a species list. You click rough grouse and you'll find pages of information and links to videos and different reports that have been written. To find out more about our forest management program, there's a link here to a 30 minute presentation by our chief forester that was given to our board of commissioners about two weeks ago. It's a fantastic overview of the management program, the challenges, the opportunities, and where he wants to take it in the future. You can follow that link or you can go to the grouse page like we just talked about 
and look under the, the frequently asked questions. There is a question, what is the Game Commission doing about habitat? And that links back to this presentation. So I encourage you to take a look at that. Finally, I just want to thank you for spending your lunch hour with us um, and learning more about this. I want to thank you for your passion, for the work you've done for grouse and the support you've given the grouse management program as we try to figure out new ways to stack the deck back in favor of birds so that we can get them out of this precarious situation and back to the business of making new generations. I just want to thank our partners now, and I'm sure you can type in questions as I go here. First, I really just want to thank the Game Commission itself, my supervisors, the executive staff, and the Board of Commissioners for allowing me to focus on this question and follow it where it goes and peel back these different layers of the onion here. I want to thank Justin Brown, our wildlife pathologist. None of this could have happened without his enthusiastic support and his assistance in the field and his connections to the wildlife disease world and laboratories. Our foresters and food and cover crews who scoured the woods to help us find grouse nests, which are really a needle in a haystack, for us to do that early study. Tim Flanagan, you probably know him as the premier grouse photographer in the country. He's a retired game warden with the Game Commission. He and his wife drove halfway across the country with grouse eggs in an incubator plugged into their cigarette lighter. It was probably the most stressful family vacation they've ever taken. Dan Snyder, the propagator who worked with us in Idaho, drove halfway across the country to meet them, hand off the eggs, continued the drive back to Idaho. And when those chicks hatched and we had to get them to the lab, he did an overnight drive with chicks in the back seat to deliver them to Colorado. I get a little emotional and I certainly get humble when I think about the number of people who have devoted their time and their passion to help this project move forward. Nicole Nemeth, who was our lab um, investigator in Colorado, and Dr. Richard Bowen, who gave us access to his lab and his personnel, we couldn't have done that original study without their help. The West Nile virus surveillance folks at DEP who listened to us back in 2013, 2014, when it sounded like we were crazy, but then went on to give us thoughtful advice and field guidance and eventually data. Rough Grouse Society, their biologist and their membership has been supportive from the very beginning, providing data and helping us get this right. Woodcock Limited has provided funds and support along the way. And then finally, that partnership for monitoring West Nile virus. They've been collecting data on mosquitoes for 20 years, and I'm sure they never expected that it would be critically important to rough grouse management. But sometimes you don't know the value of data as you're collecting it. And then finally, the grouse hunters of Pennsylvania. I'm blessed to work with these people. They're passionate. Without this, their data, none of this would have been possible. They want us to get it right. They're willing to help us get it right. They've accepted some stunning bad news over the past two years as far as disease and changes in our grouse season. Yet last year when I recommended that we close the late season, 72% of the hunters that contacted the agency were supportive of that. I can't thank them enough for their support of this program. I do want to tell you that the 2018 recommendation right now is for a continued closure of the late season this year, and that is open for public comment. There's the address if you want to submit your comments, your thoughts, or your questions, um, and we'll be taking those. It would be great if I could get them by mid-March, so I have time to organize them and time to talk to the commissioners in April when they take a final vote. That's all I have. Again, I just want to thank you, and I think we have, probably have some questions to answer. All right. Thank you for listening and thank you for your presentation, Lisa. The first question that someone wanted to know is that picture that we sent out with the, the invitation for the webinar that had you sitting beside yeah. Ralph. They want to know how that happened. <laughs> uh, so some of you have heard of this concept of tame grouse. 
uh, or drunk grouse. Um, birds will sometimes get their wires crossed in the spring and then again in the fall when day length is changing. And uh, you get these birds that become hyper territorial. So they will come running out of the woods if you're chopping wood or you start up your ATV or you're hammering. If you sound like a grouse, they'll come running out of the woods and people will say, oh, isn't that, isn't that friendly? What a great bird. But he's actually telling you to get the heck out of his territory. Um, he's not being friendly at all. And if you reach for that bird, he's gonna go for you. So that particular bird in that photo was Bob <laughs> from Warren County. He was discovered by some uh, gas well workers when they were working on the gas well, pounding and sounding like grouse. He came running out of the woods. Um, he has been a great uh, friend to us in terms of getting photos and getting video. But I think probably just right after that photo was taken, he, uh, he hit me in the chest and told me to get to get out of there. So it's not quite the, the peace and love that you think it is in the picture. <laughs> uh, how do Pennsylvania grouse population trends compare with those of the Great Lakes states and other states since the spread of West Nile virus? Well, if you look, if you think back um, to that graph I showed of multiple states in the mid-Atlantic, you can see that we're sort of all over the map. Pennsylvania tends to be pretty high in flush rates. Other states are much lower in flush rates, but we tend to track pretty well together. Good years are good years and bad years are bad. I really don't know how it compares with the Great Lakes states and I don't wanna speak for other agencies, um, but I think you probably have all heard at this point that uh, there is some concern out there in particular uh, this fall about West Nile virus in the, in the Lake State. So I'm sure that they are considering, you know, all the things that we've been looking at here over the past two years. I would love to do a large geographic study looking at antibody levels across a big geography across multiple states. That's that's big on my wish list. Is there a correlation? I thought this was a great question. Is there a correlation between a decrease in the mosquito eating bat populations and an increase in the West Nile virus carrying mosquitoes? I can't give you data on that or correlation levels, but I can tell you that it pro there probably is not. Um, if you think about, you know, we want to harvest a surplus population in any species, that's essentially what bats are eating in the, in the insect population. Um, they're probably eating surplus individuals, probably not, you know, they were probably never critically involved in suppressing mosquito populations. Bats have a lot of different insects they eat, mosquitoes being just one of them. So it's very, very muddy when you start to try to think about, you know, did this affect that? Um, the biggest issue that we saw was just that introduction of this new virus onto the continent had uh, more influence really than any other factor. Several people asked this question. Are the antibodies of those grouse that you found that are immune, are they passed on to their offspring? Well, we don't know for sure. When I talked to Nicole in the lab, um, she said that in chickens, that's one closely related species that they have studied close to grouse. They do find that there are some antibodies that pass from hen to chick, but those antibodies tend to be short lived, really just kind of a bridge until the chicks develop their own immunity. So it may last two to four weeks if they're passed on at all. The problem for us with grouse is if chicks are hatched the first of June and they have two to four weeks of protection, that's probably waning as they move into July. And that's when our West Nile virus season really kicks off. So we're not sure about antibodies passing from hen to chick. We're not sure if they do, if they would really be that protective. My hope then is that at least the genetics that allowed that hen and that drummer to survive are being passed on to chicks. So, um, there is a bright spot there, but it's not quite as nice as saying, you know, every future bird will be protected if, if this hen survives. Were the brood sightings done just on state game lands or were they done on other land as well? Our brood sightings, that, that 30 year history of brood sightings are on game lands. They're done by our foresters as they're in the field working every day. So typically they're in the field maybe 20 days a month, 25 days a month. Um, and every day they're out there, 
they report a brood sighting or a zero because those zeros are also very important. We don't just want people who see broods to tell us that they're seeing broods. We need to know a good indicator every day if you're in the forest, what are you seeing? Will the percent of immune grouse grow over time? It should. Uh, if you think of West Nile virus as a, a big funnel that grouse have to now pass through, as those birds pass through and survive, they are carrying antibodies. Um, our hope is that when they come out the other side, we don't know how long it will take, but our hope would be that those antibodies would increase as a proportion of the total population. And we, we may be seeing that in the southeast part of the state where there are a, a really nice proportion of antibodies in the southeast, even though grouse are really just impacted by West Nile almost constantly down in that region. So that gives me some hope that we will see antibody proportions grow over time. We probably will do this large scale blood sampling again, maybe in five years to take another snapshot of antibodies. Are you considering expanding the closure of the grouse seasons to anything beyond that late after Christmas season? At this point, I'm not. Um, a third of our statewide grouse harvest happens in that late season. And the purpose really of the closure is to try to move those birds into the breeding season. If I protect birds, quote, protect in October, November, they still have a long time to live before they hit the breeding season. So it's really that late season where we're harvesting a lot of adults and we're very close to the breeding season. That's the one I'm focusing on right now. All right, I know there's several more questions out there, but we're just going to um, end it on about two more, I think here. So um, if you did not get your question answered, you can email your question to pgccomment, C-O-M-M-E-N-T-S at pa.gov, and we can try to answer it there. Yeah, it's on your screen. Um, so the question is, is it safe to eat grouse with West Nile virus? I talked to the lab about this because a lot of hunters have questions about the safety of eating grouse and, and maybe even more important, the safety of handling grouse um, for them or for their dogs, in, you know, especially in that early season. Um, in Pennsylvania, we start our grouse season in the middle of October. Grouse that were sick were most likely sick in July and August and early September during the peak of West Nile. So by the time we're hunting, the birds that were actively sick would not be in the population anymore. The birds that you're seeing in October, November, December have already dealt with the disease. They have antibodies, just like you and I might have antibodies to a flu virus, but we're no longer actively sick. Okay, our final question is, are there programs to assist landowners in creating grouse habitat on their property? Yes, and that is a fantastic question. So if you have property and you're interested in managing it for grouse, woodcock, other young forest species, or even songbirds, or whatever your interest is, you can call our region office in the area that you live and ask to be put in touch with our private lands biologist for that region. They'll come out. They'll walk the property with you, they'll talk about your objectives, and then they'll write some management actions that you can take on that property, free of charge um, and available in every region of the state. All right, well, I'm sorry that we weren't able to answer everyone's questions. I know there's a lot more in there that we didn't get to yet, but again, just um, if you look at that email address on the bottom of your screen, we'll try to answer them through email. This session has been recorded and you should receive an email with a link to the recording within the next few days and it will also be uploaded to the Game Commission's YouTube channel. I'd like to thank Lisa for coming and sharing her expertise and time with us today. It was a really interesting webinar to hear about this cutting edge research with West Nile virus and rough grouse. Um, and we'd also like to thank all of you who participated in the webinar and took time out of your busy schedules to join us this afternoon. We hope that you'll join us again to learn more about Pennsylvania wildlife in upcoming webinars. Send us an email at that email address on the bottom of the screen if you have a webinar topic that you'd like to see us cover. Until then, we hope you're able to get outside and enjoy some of Pennsylvania's great outdoors.